Okay, good evening and uh, welcome to the session of today. And uh, we are glad that uh, the Lord has given us a chance to be able to share in his word again. And so, as uh, you know, the session of today, we are looking at, uh, uh, we are looking at uh, uh, day six, Jesus' nature in his incarnation, was Christ still divine in his incarnation? And if so, what constituted his uh, divine nature Part two, and then um, uh, in the same, we shall be going to look at uh, the death of Jesus Christ. And uh, we are not just discussing for a matter of uh, having knowledge in these things, but uh, that uh, we may be established in present truth so that um, we may give a reason of our faith and uh, what uh, we believe. Otherwise, I'd like us to pray and uh, go ahead with the session of today. Heavenly Father, Thank you for the Sabbath that has come to us, Lord. Thank you for the six days you have given us to worship you uh, in different ways and to do our own works. But Lord, now this is a, a time for repose and uh, rethink of our spiritual status as we fellowship with thee and thy son through thy Holy Spirit. Thank you for what we learn or like us to learn. And uh, may it be that uh, we shall be drawn close to thee and to one another after we have finished this thing. Uh, we, we thank the Lord so much, although uh, I'm really having a trouble with the network. I don't know if uh, people are having uh, the same troubles that uh, uh, we are having, but uh, the full session will be uploaded on YouTube on our channel under the series of the conference panel discussion uh, July 2021. And so we can revisit it and see all the things that uh, maybe we could have missed through uh, uh, this uh, network uh, uh, hiccups. And so the Heavenly Father is good that uh, he allows us to study things so that uh, we may move together as brethren. We are told that, uh, behold, how good when brethren dwell together in unity. And this is uh, the unity that everyone is striving for. We want to achieve it in our lives so that uh, Christ may be uh, 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 glorified in uh, our lives. Christ may be glorified in uh, our lives. And so, please keep praying for the network. It has a lot of problems. It has a lot of problems, but uh, I hope we shall continue and uh, as our other brethren join in. The nature of Jesus Christ, part two. And uh, yesterday when we were finishing, actually a question was uh, posed a question was posed that uh, uh, deity did not sing uh, and uh, deity did not die. And the, there's another quote that says that actually deity. And so I, I like to, I like us to explore these things. I like us to explore the question that uh, we really left pending yesterday that uh, deity did not sing. And the support that says that deity sang under the heavy burden of Calvary. I don't know what I'll do with this, but uh, the network is really bringing a lot of problems. Uh, let us just uh, offer another word of prayer. Heavenly Father, I pray that uh, you may take uh, charge of these feeble instruments, that Lord, we may use it for the glory and honor of thy name. Hear our prayers, and Lord, you know that uh, Satan will not want us to get the message, but uh, let uh, uh, your heavenly power take control of everything, that uh, we may be benefited by these discussions. In Jesus' name, amen. And so I, I like to say this, that uh, 
when uh, when uh, when we read the bible when uh, we read the bible in the book of john chapter 2 verses 19 to 21 we are told that uh, Jesus answered and said unto them, destroy this temple, and in three days I'll raise, raise, raise it up. Then said uh, the Jewish, 46 years was this temple in building, and will thou rear it up in three nights. Uh, but he spoke of the temple of his body. And so uh, when we are talking about date did not die, or but uh, and another quotes that we shall be looking at, let us just try to lay foundation as we look even at the death of Jesus Christ. Uh, in John chapter 10, verses 17 uh, to 19, we are told, therefore, that my father loved me because I laid down my life that I might take it again. No man taketh it out from me, but I lay it down myself. I have power to lay it down and I have power to take it again. This commandment have I received uh, of my father. I'd like to share the screen so that uh, we may have the benefit of everyone. Uh, again, and so the Bible is very clear here. Jesus stated, I'll raise it, my human body up. And he explained that God the Father told him to lay down his life and then it, take it back again. He had the power to do uh, this because uh, we are told that the two expression human and divine were in Christ closely and inseparably one and yet they had a distinct personality and so uh, in 5 BC in 5 BC 1127.1 as a member of the human family he was mortal but as God he was the fountain of life to the world he could in his divine person ever had withstood the advances of death and refused to come under its dominion. But he voluntarily laid down his life that in so doing, he might give life and bring immortality to life. He bore the sins of the world and endured the penalty which rolled like a mountain upon his divine soul. He yielded up his life sacrifice that man should not eternally die. He died not through being compelled to die, but by his own free will. This was humility. The whole treasure of heaven was poured out in one gift to save fallen man. He brought into his own human nature all the life-giving energies that human beings will need and must receive. And so, wondrous combination of man and God, he might have helped his human nature to withstand the inroads of disease by pouring from his divine nature vitality and undecaying vigor to the human. But he humbled himself to man's nature. Look at the quote very carefully. Wondrous combination of man and God. He might have helped his human nature to withstand the inroads of disease by pouring from his divine nature. So Christ could pour from his divine nature vitality, um, uh, from his divine nature vitality and undecaying vigor to the human. But he never did this. He vol voluntarily uh, uh, accepted death, 5 BC 1127.2. And so um, uh, we are told that uh, in MR uh, page, MR 21, page 414, when Christ was crucified, it was his human nature that died. Deity did not sing and die. That would have been impossible. That is where Brother Kosge actually left it yesterday. When Christ was crucified, it was his human nature that died. Deity did not sink and die. That would have been impossible. Now we understand that two natures existed in Christ, that is the divine and the human. And then we are told deity did not sink and die. Then look at the next statement in volume five, page uh, 1113. When the voice of the angel was heard saying, thy father calls thee, he who had said, I lay down my life that I might not take it again, that I might take it again, destroy this temple and in three days I'll raise it up, came forth from the grave to life that was in himself. In him was life original and borrowed and drive. 
Deity did not die. Humanity died. So E.G. White is contrasting the two. That is, although it had Jesus Christ had these two individuality, the divine and the human, humanity died, but deity did not die. But Christ now proclaims over the reign sepulchre of, Jos of Joseph, I am the resurrection and life. In his divinity, Christ possessed the power to break the bonds of death. He says, I am the resurrection and the life. He who, sa who had said, I lay down my life that I may take it again, came forth from the grave to life that was in himself. Humanity died, divinity did not die. And uh, uh, Jesus Christ laid off his royal robe, his kingly crown, and clothed his divinity with humanity. So what Christ stripped himself from was the royal robe, the kingly crown. But uh, his divinity, he clothed it with humanity. And uh, uh, he was placed on second probation. Uh, not on second probation, but he was placed on probation. Jesus Christ, when he came on earth, he was placed on probation. Adam, when he was created, he was uh, uh, actually placed on probation. I hope people know uh, uh, of that. And so uh, he veiled actually the divinity with humanity. Uh, in order to become a substitute and surety for humanity, that dying in humanity, he might by his death destroy him who had the power of death. He could not have done this as God, but by coming as a man, uh, Christ could die. Letter 97, 18, 98, paragraph 11. And so we ask ourselves, did E.G. White contradict herself? Because uh, 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 she says, uh, in one place, deity did not sing and die. And then uh, uh, also in another place, she says the deity did not sing under the agonizing torch of Calvary. But in another quote in MS 153, 1898, paragraph 21, she says, men need to understand that deity suffered and sung under the agonies of Calvary. So there are two places she says that deity did not sing under the agonizing torture of the Calvary. The deity did not sing under the agonizing torture of Calvary. And in another place, she says that um, deity did not sing and die. And then in another place, she says, deity suffered and sang under the organs of Calvary. So which is which? We try to break it down. And as I'm just finishing my submission uh, so that I may welcome others to contribute. In all the three statements, deity did not die. If you have noticed that. She says, in all the three statements, deity did not uh, did not die, but there is a place she says that um, deity suffered and sang, but that does not say that deity actually uh, uh, died. And so, look here in the second and third statement, which do seem to contradict each other. We see the definite the definite article the in only one of the statement, the deity did not sing then deity suffered and sang. So we again look at the quote, the full quote, and be careful about it. It will seem to me that the solution, uh, and I'm just uh, reading it over, uh, that um, when Sister White speaks of the deity which did not sing under Calvary's torture, she's speaking of God the Father. Let us just uh, revisit, uh, revisit the quote again. This is the quote. Jesus was, uh, it says, there is no one who can explain the mystery of the incarnation of Christ. Yet we know that he came to this earth and lived as a man among men. The man Christ Jesus was not the Lord God Almighty, yet Christ and the Father are one. The deity did not sing under the agonizing torture of Calvary. So there is the definite article. And here we have the father and the son. And so I believe this is primarily uh, uh, actually pointing uh, 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 at the father that uh, uh, he did not uh, uh, really uh, 
did not sing under the agonizing uh, torture of Calvary, but he was there by his son. But again, we have deity suffered and sung under the agonies of Calvary, which really applies now to Jesus Christ. Yes, Jesus Christ, uh, whom God gave for the ransom of the world, purchased the church with his own blood. Now, if deity did not die, was the sacrifice then human? That is the next question that people really ask themselves. That, um, uh, 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 And when we are talking about deity, it is about his divinity. Actually, uh, 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 it, it suffered and it sang, and uh, I'll be able to explain uh, how I understand that. We are told that the deity did not sing and die applying to the father because the father was at Calvary. And then we are told that deity uh, 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 sang and suffered, that is Jesus Christ. And um, what I understand is what is spoken in uh, Isaiah chapter 53, that he poured out his soul. That is, uh, and Christ did not pour out his human soul, actually. Christ uh, 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 said, my father, my father, why have thou forsaken me? Uh, this was the sundering of the divine powers. This is the sinking and suffering of the deity. That is Jesus Christ, because he was deity and he was a divine being. And so in that sun, uh, uh, sundering of the divine nature, that is the father and the son being separated. Actually, I find that this is where actually Sister White says that deity suffered and uh, 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 sung under the agony, but where she says that the deity did not sing and suffer, that applies to the father. And so this actually doesn't bring out the notion that human sacrifice is what happened. Jesus Christ was a divine being. You have to understand as um, we saw that, uh, and Elder Patrick was saying that uh, he did not lose his first birth. And so he had his first birth and his first birth was divine being. And this separation, this sundering of the divinity is actually what I believe was the ransom of his soul so that he was no more in com communication with the father and his divinity uh, uh, did not um, lay their dormant uh, with all that pertains to Jesus Christ in the tomb for an allotted time. Uh, in 3SP, page 203.2, we are told, the spirit of Jesus slept in the tomb with his body and did not wing it his way to heaven, there to maintain a separate existence and to look down upon the mourning disciples embalming the body from which it had been taken flight. All that comprised the life and intelligence of Jesus remained with his body in the sepulcher. And when he came forth, it was a whole being. He did not have to summon his spirit from heaven. He had power to lay it down. Uh, he had power to lay down his life and to take it up again. And so as Amen. we understand that when people die, the spirit does not go up, but it remains with them. Uh, everything that comprises with them remains with them. So Jesus Christ, when he, he died, you understand he, was, he had humanity and divinity. Divinity did not go to heaven, but lay there dormant in his body uh, for an allotted time, as Sister White says. And so the sacrifice was not human, but because divinity was rendered unfunctional in the grave, that comprised infinite divine sacrifice. I think I have spoken for 20 minutes. I'll welcome submission, question, and clarification where it is uh, not being understood. Welcome, everyone. Hello. Hello. I have a question. There is a verse that says that my father, I lay my spirit on your hands. I've just forgotten the verse that I think it's in the book of John. Yes. How can you connect that with the quote that you have just read last? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Brother Dickens. Uh, uh, for uh, for your question. Uh, thank you for how do I how do how do I reconcile with the last 
quote that I read, when Jesus Christ slept in, with, uh, in the tomb with his body and did not wing it his way to hell, um, and did, the spirit of Jesus slept in the tomb with his body and did not wing its way to heaven. Um, how do I reconcile that with that? In thy hands, I commit my spirit. Uh, that statement, I commit my spirit, actually, uh, it is a statement of faith that uh, the son in the council of peace, they had agreed with the father that he will not uh, allow his body to see corruption. And so if he was faithful, uh, uh, he would be resurrected by the glory of the father. We find that in the DNA. And uh, again, we know that uh, Sister White says that uh, when Christ faced his death, he did not see beyond the portholes of tomb. He laid in faith as we lay in faith that uh, we shall see the resurrection morning. Although he was assured, but he thought that the penalty of sin uh, was so disgusting, the, the, the burden of sin was so disgusting, uh, disgusting to God that um, he will not dare uh, accept, uh, uh, he, he will not be resurrected. He, he just lay a prisoner of hope that the sacrifice had been accepted. The father was not there to assure him that the sacrifice had been accepted before he died. And so when he was dying, he laid in faith. He did not see beyond the portals of, uh, the, portals of the tomb. And so, I lay in thy hand, my spirit, actually is uh, to say that, Father, I have accomplished everything. If it is fine, then uh, uh, um, I hope to see the end of this uh, uh, in resurrection. And then he, 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 he commended his spirit. He commended all his life to, to the Father, uh, the one that was able to bring him back to, to life. That is all I can say. If there is any addition, somebody can add. And uh, what you are asking, thank you, brother. Uh, uh, the verse is in uh, Luke chapter 23, verses 46. Maybe, uh, brother Sami, can I add to that? Um, yes, Eldangasa, go ahead. Um, that uh, you have answered very well, honestly. Um, I'm just add, I'm adding to that question by brother Dickens, just as a support. But may I make remarks that the pre you, on the question of divinity not dying, uh, I want to praise the Lord. This uh, morning, I was discussing this matter with Elder Dan, trying to brief him up uh, how we are, where we are with the studies, and I'm happy I can see him here. Exactly what we agreed with him in the morning is what you presented. I can only say hallelujah. Um, that when you, when you say the deity did not sink, the father did not die. Then you have said when deity sank, we mean the son, the divine son died what as we know death. And now, then we have a divine sacrifice. Amen. So I have nothing to add there. Um, um, I Just to remember what Stephen said and what Jesus said. What did Stephen say in um, Acts chapter 7? In Acts chapter 7, verse uh, 59. Acts chapter 7, verse 59. Um, this is what Stephen said. Those will be the same words of faith. Those will just be the same words of faith. Stephen says, um, and they stoned Stephen, calling upon God and saying, Lord Jesus. And they stoned Stephen. Um, this, my King James, is a bit different. Um, um, but Stephen died saying, and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Now, that is the same language. Um, Stephen was not here saying, oh, my spirit wings woo woo and goes to, 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 to where Jesus is. No. It was a statement of faith, just like um, as the statement of faith which Jesus made to the Father. Now, right there, right there. Oh, sorry. There it is. I, yeah, that's 759. And saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. So that is basically the same thing which Jesus spoke, because death, there is no any other way uh, to define death. Because death is the separation of body and spirit, and that is the, the death which Jesus went through. Otherwise, it will not be death. But Jesus, even that uh, point of, uh, I have power to take it again. 
I want to say, I, I want to submit brethren that that statement is a statement of faith. That I have power to take it back. That is a statement of faith. In that, if he had sinned, look here friends, if he had sinned, will he have the power to take it back? Oh no, he will not. So it was a statement of faith that Father, I am going to trust in your word. I'm going to walk um, in your words. And I know, Father, if I'm faithful, I will take that back, that life back, that life that I left in your hands. So um, that's uh, that's what I will say there. But Brother Sami, uh, as we move on, the, yes. um, there's something you said, which I know we are going to address the issues of the omnis and uh, all those other matters. But may I alert, uh, indeed you've said, Jesus will not see beyond the tomb. Uh, Jesus did not so see beyond the tomb. Meaning, if he was omniscient here, he will see that. He will see that. I'm just trying to pick on that point. That when he when 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 was he, he thought sin was so awful that he will eternally perish. But was that the same case with the father, so that we understand omniscience and all that? Because was, was the father surprised that Jesus was going to be resurrected? No, because he saw him being faithful. And as even Jesus lay in the tomb, the father knew he will be, he will resurrect him. So now, even by that, at least idea that, uh, that Jesus did not see beyond the tomb, meaning he did not know about that, but had faith that he'll be resurrected, um, um, will tell us something about when we come to the point of discussing the omnis. But as to what, how you have laid the foundation, I want to thank God that it's clear. The, 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 all the quotations by Sister White on divinity did not die or deity sank or the deity are very clear and we may understand that very clearly. So uh, God's grace, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I think Brother Dickens, you have been answered and uh, I hope uh, the people in Rongo have been uh, answered um, uh, the question, but I'd like to add something also just uh, to continue. The captain of our salvation was perfected through suffering. His soul was made an offering for sin. It was necessary for the awful darkness to gather about the soul because of the withdrawal of the father's love and favor. For he was standing in the sinner's place and this darkness every sinner must experience. The righteous one must suffer the condemnation and wrath of God not in vindictiveness, for the heart of God yearned with great sorrow when his son, the guiltless, was suffering the penalty of sin. This sundering of the divine powers will never again occur throughout the eternal ages, which means it is something that um, uh, happened once for the reason of the sacrifice of sin, and it will never be repeated, meaning that sin will uh, uh, never repeat itself again. Uh, again, we read the son of God placed his entire being, even his divinity into the father's hands. He, had he sinned in any particular, then he would have never lived again, but he, we know he did not sin. Thus the father never took his son's deity away. And so the son uh, trusted that the father would awaken him according to the prophetic word. And this is what happened. He who died for the sins of the world was to remain in the tomb for the allotted time. He was in that stony prison house uh, as a prisoner of divine justice. And he was uh, responsible to the judge of the universe. He was bearing the sins of the world and his father only could release him. Youth instructor, May 2, 1901, paragraph eight. And so I hope uh, uh, that um, uh, suffices. Signs of the time, Jesus was bearing the sin of the world he was enduring the curse of the law. He was vindicating the justice of God. Separation from his father, the punishment for transgression was to fall upon him. So it was the separation uh, from his father that um, was uh, falling uh, uh, upon him. And so there's uh, another thing that um, I, I, I like to look at as even uh, we head to the death of Jesus Christ and uh, the omnis, if time will uh, uh, accept. 
the sacrifice at Calvary, how we really understand really uh, what um, uh, happened, if um, we really understand uh, what happened about um, the, the, the price of our redemption, what did it actually, uh, what did it actually do or what did it actually comprise uh, of? That is what uh, I want us to look at. That uh, what did it comprise of and how is the father involved in uh, giving that sacrifice? I'd like to propose something and uh, I'll share my screen because it is easier that way. I just I, I don't just want to read. I want to read my notes with us so that uh, we 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 may also have the privilege of reading those notes. And by the way, uh, I want to thank Brother Patrick and Elder Dan if they discussed something in the morning, and uh, I was not uh, with them, and uh, they were able to come up with uh, some of the things that uh, I have put in the document. The price for redemption paid by them both. Remember, this is a free platform where we discuss these things. And so I'm going to give in my submission that the offering, the, the redemption was paid by them both. Zechariah 6, 13, even he shall build the temple of the Lord and he shall bear the glory and shall sit and rule upon his throne. And he shall be a priest upon his throne and the council of peace shall be between them both. Now, as surely as the council was between them both, so was the paying of the price. How? Look at this. As the disciples comprehended it, as their perception took hold of God's divine compassion, they realized that there is, in, is a sense in which the sufferings of the son were the sufferings of the father. From eternity, there was a complete union between the Father and the Son. There were two, yet little short of being identical, two in individuality, yet one in spirit and heart and character. So the suffering of the Son was the suffering of the Father. The reason why people say that it is only Christ who paid the, 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 the sacrifice, it is because they just look at the cross only at the death. But think about this, that uh, I, I want to put a statement uh, on the board that man was not created for redemption. Uh, I think we have uh, shared this with some people. Uh, man was not created, uh, man not created, not created for redemption. This is found in uh, 3SM 134.4. Look at this. The Lord did not make man to be redeemed, but bear his image. But through sin, man lost the image of God. It is only by man's redemption that God can accomplish his design for him, making him a son of God. Now, there is a very serious issue that... Uh, Man was not created for redemption. People think that uh, the reason why God had a son, it was to give out. No, that was not the thing. God had a son, as even we have sons and daughters, so that we may have a family. But now here there is sin, or there is a situation that demands a ransom be given, and as a parent who loves the only child you have, not given back to him so that you may give out him when the situation is, you give out out of that love. Man was not created for redemption, and so Jesus Christ was not begotten for the plan of redemption. It was out of love. God could have said, let man perish, because Christ was not begotten for redemption. But you see the love of God in uh, giving out his son. And three times when the son wants to come to the earth, uh, the father cannot allow in heaven. Three times 
And then he goes again and tells him, this is the time that I should be going. And then at the end, the father releases him to go. And so uh, we are told in Youth Instructor December 16, that the suffering of the son was the sufferings of the father. It even hurt the father more. The burden of the sin and the pain of it, um, when you see, when there is uh, somebody having a debt, and then uh, you use someone else to pay, uh, that's something that belongs just to you. It is like you have paid actually the debt yourself. And so it, it, I, I submit that uh, we should not just see that the price was paid by the son alone, but father, the father also participated in this. Uh, in uh, uh, Australian uh, Union uh, recorder, we are told that this redemption might be ours. God withheld not even the sacrifice of himself. He gave himself in his son. The father suffered with Christ in all his humiliation and agony. He suffered as he saw the son of his love despised and rejected by those who he came to elevate, a noble and save. He saw him hanging upon the cross, mocked and jeered by the passers-by, and he hid as it were his face from him. He saw Christ bearing the sin of the world and dying in the sinner's stead. The human heart knows the love of a parent for his child. We know what a mother's love will do and suffer for her beloved one, but never can the heart of man fathom the depths of God's self-sacrifice. And so, uh, I wish to say that no human language could be framed to give a just conception of the fullness of the love of God. Even the infinite God who suffered in his son. 16 MR 193.1. The cross, the cross, it is set up that we may understand and know the only true God and Jesus Christ whom he has sent. It tells us of the depth and breadth of infinite love, the greatness of the Father's love. It reveals the astonishing truth that God the Father gave himself in his son. We are talking about the price of redemption and what these things really mean. Another one, and then I open up for contribution, 7 BC 974. It was then seen that God had in his son denied himself giving himself for the sins of the world because he loved mankind. And so the creator was revealed in the son of infinite God. Here the question, can there be self-denial with God? Was forever answered. Christ was God and condescending to be made flesh. He assumed humanity and became obedient unto death that he might undergo infinite sacrifice. God has measured how much it costs to save man. This salvation was accomplished only by the sacrifice of himself in his son. Exalt the God of heaven, you can realize the depth of his self-sacrifice for he suffered with his son. I welcome contribution that the redemption was paid by both the father and the son. I don't know if silence means agreement or disagreement. Well, uh, it, it just uh, strengthens the verse in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 19. To wit, that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. It really confirms that. I really have not seen those quotes and I appreciate that they have been read there. Before uh, I bring in another contribution, this is uh, Science of the Times, uh, 4th November, 1908. The law of God could not be set aside even to save lost man. The well-being of the universe demanded that divine government should be maintained. 
but in his infinite love and mercy, the creator sacrificed himself in his son. God himself bore the, pon the penalty of transgression. Then Christ himself was the world, the wisdom of God, and in him, God himself came down from heaven. Uh, another one, because divinity alone could be efficacious in the restoration of man from the poisonous bruise of the serpent, God himself in his only begotten son assumed human nature. Ellen G. White, youth instructor. And the last two ones, God displayed his power and wisdom in the work of creation. He revealed his majesty in the giving of his law. And finally, in the person of his son, he came to the world to show his love and grace. God has adopted human nature in the person of his son. Now, let me make another point clear that uh, this is not uh, the doctrine of Sibelianism. Sibelianism teaches that uh, there is one God, but three manifestations. In the Old Testament, it was the Father. In the New Testament, it was the Son. And after ascension, uh, the same God was the Holy Spirit. I don't teach that. I don't subscribe to that. I believe that there is the Father, a literal being. There is the Son, a literal being. And there is their omnipresent spirit coming with all the fullness of the divine power. And it is not three manifestations, but it is an actuality. It's a family uh, thing. Uh, it's a relational um, uh, issue that we are talking about. And so uh, at least we can start getting the glimpse of uh, what redemption actually entails. And uh, we are told that all heaven was imperiled by giving Jesus Christ to die for our sin. For if he could have sinned, then the world and Christ himself would have been lost. And if Christ would have been lost, then if only it is three manifestations, then if Christ could have been lost, there will be no God. But uh, again, if we hang up to the issues that uh, then uh, Christ cannot die, then his death was a mockery. It was like uh, uh, a trickery that he did not die, but he pretended he died. But no way, if we, if we take the position there was an uh, uh, eternal risk, then we know that Christ died. And if he had sinned, he could have been lost. We are told that the punishment could have fallen on him as it could have fallen on Adam. So what punishment could have fallen on Adam if there was no redemption? Lost forever. And so Jesus Christ could have been lost and all that comprised him uh, could have been laid there dormant and destroyed by God himself. I go to the uh, third part of the presentation. Which death did Jesus Christ die? And it will open up a discussion of uh, the three omnis. Which death did Jesus Christ Yes. Just before you proceed, um, I want to, again, appreciate what you've shared um, about making that clarification uh, against Sabellianism. And so that when the Father offered himself by giving Christ, we really need to understand um, two texts there. I know Brother Junior has uh, commented on, um, on on 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 19. Now, the other text which we can combine with that so that we are very clear is 1 Timothy 3, 16, that God was manifest in the flesh. Now, if that is not carefully understood, both verses, if they are not carefully understood, there is a possibility of ending up to saying that it was the Father who was here literally in that body. Now, that's why we must guard. Then I'm saying, look, in fact, if you look at what Paul is saying in chapter uh, 5, sorry, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 19, he is speaking about the story of redemption, whereby even you and I, in order to receive the ministry of reconciliation, God ought to be in us. 
And the only way for God to be in us, we, we have to depend on Jesus for God to be in us. Now, when we come again to, to 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, God manifest in the flesh, we too must, when the world looks at, at us, must say truly God manifest in the flesh, meaning the character of the Father manifest uh, from us. But how do we, does that happen? We always by Jesus. Now then, how do we really understand how God was in Christ and suffering with him? It's very easy. Look at Romans chapter 1, verse 20. By looking at the things made, we may understand the things of God. And even this uh, salvation, we may understand. When a father who loves his son, I'm speaking of a natural man like you and I, I mean, and here, there is, I mean, I wanted to give my kidney. Let's say I wanted to give my kidney to my son who, who seriously needed that kidney, but I'm unable to give him. You see that? Then I'll suffer with him there. As he's suffering, I'm suffering with him. I, it may not capture very well because um, we know the father, James White says the father and the son were one in nature, were one in purpose, and were one in um, character. Now, we, what purpose was the father and the son one? What purpose? We know the purpose of creation, they were one. And then the purpose of redemption, they were one. So that's how God suffered, because he was one with the son, wanting to do it himself, but he could not do it in that the father cannot die. And so if we look at it in that sense, then we will know and we will be protected from the idea that when the Bible says God was in Christ, then it will mean the father was in Christ, literally. No, it wasn't so. It's because of that perfect unity, sharing one mind, agonizing together. And, and that's what it means there. So that God being in Christ is the same way God is in Christ is in us, but now by the agency of Christ, the mediator, but God, Christ needing no mediator, the Father was in him by, by his word. And, and that's the same matter to us because that same ministry of reconciliation, which was now effected by Christ, we also committed to us. And surely, let me ask a question as I, I, as I, as I, as I, as I, as I, as I let you go on to the next uh, question. Um, John chapter 3, verse 34 says, He whom the Father giveth spirit without measure speaks the word of the Father. Now, may I ask a question? Can we speak the words of the Father if we don't have the same, the same measure of the Spirit? Can we partake of less of it and speak the words of the Father because we are here to represent Christ and to speak the exact same of the, of the Father? We are, we are the ones spreading the three angels' messages. How shall we do that if we partake of the less? That's why in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 19, it says we too partake of the fullness by Jesus. We partake of the fullness. So that when we study the word, when I don't know whether we shall come to that, what does it mean that Christ was the, had the fullness of God here? What does it mean? Does it mean that he had all the attributes of God? We could study that as you go to the next bit. Uh, that's, that, that will be my submission. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Brother Patrick. And uh, I just want to look at two texts. Two texts. We hear people say that uh, Christ died the second death. But actually, what does that mean? Do we believe in the second death? I'll offer my submission. I don't believe that Christ died the second death because the plain reading of the verse does not allow me to believe that. And death, Revelation 20 verses 14, and death and hell were cast in the lake of fire. This is the second death. So what comprises death is uh, death and hell being cast into the lake of fire. But also there's another thing uh, in 21.8, but the fearful and unbelieving and abominable and murderers and warmongers and sorcerers and adulterers and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Christ actually, and this brimstone uh, actually brings everything to annihilation. They will never exist again, but Christ is existing again. And so uh, I really uh, don't buy the idea that uh, Christ really died the second death. But uh, what I know, uh, and I can produce evidence and scriptures that uh, Jesus Christ suffered what the sinner who has not repented would ever be able to suffer. And so there is this statement, Jesus Christ tested the second death uh, for us, but actually Christ did not die the second death. He experienced 
what you know you have have an experience but not go that uh, uh, way of uh, uh, being annihilated from God uh, forever. Uh, I'll give you an example of this. In the book of uh, Jeremiah, we are told that look at men holding their bellies as if they were pregnant. But can I ask you, really, do, uh, do men have pregnancy? But we are told that in this time of anguish, men will be holding their bellies as if they are in birth pains. Men do not really have pregnancy, but they can experience birth pain. Christ did not die the second death, but experienced uh, actually what the sinner will experience if he doesn't uh, repent. And so uh, I'd like to welcome contribution on that as we open up, we will be opening up the part of the omnis. Uh, what do you understand by second death and did Jesus Christ really suffer, the, uh, die the second death or suffer the second death? Welcome. there anyone with submission? Uh, Elder Sami, good evening. Good evening, Elder Dan. Yeah, thank you so much for opening this up. Um, I've been following the discussion and just as you, as you open up this part from the second death, I have been looking at these two, the two places where John refers to the second death. That's in um, Revelation 20, verse 14, and Revelation 21, verse 8. Let me just read uh, Revelation 20, verse 14, which you will, I think you've just read. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And then Revelation 21, verse 8 says, but the fearful and believing in the abom abominable and murderers and warmongers and sorcerers, and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. So to ask, the question you have asked is, which death did Christ die? If we look at this part from the perspective of John, John is looking at prophecy. Ahead of time, he is seeing what happens in prophecy way after uh, the judgment and actually what happens in the judgment. So he's seeing uh, the events leading to the judgment, the judgment itself, and also the events after the judgment. And so when he is giving the perspective of this second death, he's also seeing it in terms of those who died the second death never arose again. They never rose again. And so he's able to say confidently, this is the second death. But we know that Christ rose again. So he could not fit this picture of the second death. So it's a very good way of us seeing what is the second death. But again, I don't know whether you are saying it directly or implicitly, because the nature of the death of Christ will necessarily require us to also consider what death means. Because for someone to die, it means they are not alive. They are, the connection that keeps them alive is cut. And even their part in the land of the living is gone, it is gone. And so now, when we look at what John says of the second death, we must also keep in mind that death is complete separation from the land of the living. And that is the nature of the death that Christ died. He did not have something floating somewhere and that would now reconnect. And now this thing that people say, oh, he's watching over us. There was nothing like that. And so 
look at the perspective that John is giving the second death, that he's seeing this death. Anybody who passed through the second, who went into the second death, never rose again. But we know Christ rose again, and so he did not die the second death. Personally, I was one of those who was thinking that Christ died the second death so that he may pay the price for the sinner. In other words, if he did not go through the second death, then the sinner's debt was not paid. But yes, as much as Christ paid that debt by giving his own life, he did not become a captive of the grave forever. He rose again, and so he did not die the second death, despite paying the price. For a sinner like me, he paid the price, but he rose again because he was obedient to the Father, and the Father gave him life again. I, th I thought that's a perspective that we need to give it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Brother Dan. Something that just came up on my mind as you were speaking. Okay. What is the penalty of sin? Is it the second death? Someone? Is there uh, anywhere in SOP or in Bible that says that the penalty of sin is second death? The price, I mean the redemption price for, um, uh, for sin is second death. No, I don't think we'll find that. No. No. There's nothing like that. So I don't think the price was paid by the second death. Yet I'm very happy with the idea. I, I, had not, I had not thought of what you have said. Yeah. Uh, I know I'm one of the few ones or many ones who uh, had come to understand this, that Christ did not die the second death. And I'm happy to have learned that. It's very clear indeed. He did not sin. But I like the angle you brought that that suffering uh, is something like what the sinner will experience. That being cut off from God, even that little bit, is what really the sinner will get at the end without hope of resurrection. But Christ had hope of resurrection. So I like that bit. I, it can be hard to explain, but I heard you and I think, and I thank God for that. That's very correct. That that being cut off, that being, that that even that feeling Christ had which you had spoken of earlier, that he didn't look hope, he didn't see him beyond, he didn't see himself beyond the, the tomb, something like that. That feeling, that awful feeling um, um, is, um, speaks to the idea that that is the experience which the, the sinners will have. So that angle I liked, it has, there's something there. Thank you. I, I, I'd like us to look at what pioneers believe, if you will allow me. A, am I cutting somebody out? Because uh, it seems like I'm talking too much. Is, is there anyone I'm shutting out? Good evening, our brethren in Rongo. Are our brethren in Rongo there by proxy or they are there? We are there, Brother Sam. Are we shutting anyone out? Can you hear us? Yeah, I can hear you. Yeah, we are here. We are following, though we had some problem, Kidogo, Lakini, to reconnect. Only some, I, I think we lost just two minutes when okay. you were speaking after Brother Patrick was speaking the last before you spoke. I'm asking, are we shutting anyone out? Are things trying to become clear or they are becoming difficult? Uh, okay, we, 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 I think they are clear. We are not having any trouble here. Uh huh. Maybe on the issue on the second death, maybe I also wanted to say something small. Continue, Brother Kosge. Yeah, uh, I know for a long time, actually, I personally also have believed that Christ suffered the second death, though I had never seen things the way you just um, presented. But once you just spoke and, and gave actually the idea and something just struck my mind that actually what does it contribute or what are the factors that lead to the first death and what are the factors that lead to the second death? I think normally as human beings, 
we can face death anytime and anything can lead to our death. It can be an accident, it can be a disease, it can be anything. But I think what leads to the second death is not such a thing as accident or disease or such a thing. But there is a statement which Jesus says, we should not fear the one which can destroy the body only, but we should fear the one which can destroy the body plus the soul in hell. And I think if we can view second death in that respect, that second death is that ultimate death which come at last. And once somebody is dissociated by the second death, there, there is no hope completely of coming back. There, there is no living again. And if Christ is actually sunk in the second death, as you just explained, he will not have come because he will have been dissociated completely never to come back again. So I just want to make that contribution in line with what, with what you just uh, friends presented. Thank, thank you so much. And as I go to uh, what the pioneers uh, actually had to say on this, I believe that if Christ died the second death, which means not coming back, then no one is going to heaven. Because uh, look at uh, somebody find me a verse in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. If Christ is, is not resurrected, then we are still in our sin. Quickly, somebody to find me 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Verses 17, are we there? 15, 17. Yeah. yeah. And if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain, you are yet in your sins. Then they also which are fallen asleep in Christ are perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. But now Christ is risen from the dead and become the first fruit of them that sleep. For sin by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, that is actually, we can die anytime as Kosge says, even so in Christ shall we be made alive because he resurrected. So if Christ really died the second death, there is no coming back and all humanity is perished, then we are still in our sins. There is no propitiation of sin. Sin is still being counted on everyone. But Second Corinthians says that God is not imputing sin on us because he imputed on the son. I'll just read a, a few things that uh, the pioneers say. This is James Stephenson, the atonement. The penalty of God's law for original sin is death, not a first death. Mark the import of the language in which the first penalty is plotted. For in the day that thou eateth thereof, thou shalt surely die. As in Adam all die, it is the penalty for personal sin is equally explicit. The wages of sin is death, not a second death, but simply death. Sin when finished bringeth forth death. To illustrate the penalty, to illustrate the penalty in the state of Illinois for murder is death. Now, suppose a man to be executed according to their law, then to be raised from the dead and executed a second time for another offense, Will the fact of the same man's being put to death a second time make the penalty in that state for murder a first death? Certainly not. But in case of the same man should die a second time, it will be in reference to it is order a first death. So uh, death, first, second death are just orders of it. Christ not only died a previous death and not being exposed to subsequent death could die neither a first nor a second death, but as the scripture plainly teach, he died the death of the cross. For if, when we were sinners, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, not a first or a second death, but the death. This brings us to consider the difficulties in the way of man's salvation. Elet Joseph Wagoner, EJ, the penalty of disobedience in Eden was not removed by the substitution of Christ. It stayed to be executed upon the wicked, generally in the second death, says Wagoner. In Adam all die, but both righteous and wicked, men and little children, and so Christ shall all be made alive. First Corinthians 15, 22. Christ does this for all, because no one is to blame or being the descendant of Adam, and thus mortal. When all have been made alive, it will be seen who are worthy to have life continued to them, and those who have died in their iniquity shall die the second time. Ezekiel 18, 26. This is the death to which God 
her reference when he said to Adam, in the day that thou eat this thereof, thou shalt surely die. That penalty has never been executed. Through the kindness of God in Christ, the execution of the penalty was stayed in order to give fallen man another chance for his life. Christ tested death for every man, and those who accept his sacrifice will escape the penalty for sin. But upon those who do not, it will fall grievously. Uh, Joseph Wagoner, um, E.J. Wagoner continues, differentiating first and second death. Being on my holidays, I have met with a few friends who have given me certain numbers of present truth to read, in which among other questions, you have answered a question concerning the nature and destiny of man. I am greatly interested in the subject and as an earnest seeker for truth, I humbly ask you to oblige, with me, oblige me with answers to the following question. Is natural death or what we term the first death the result of sin? If it is, why could not why could not belief in Christ remove it, since it removes the second death, or what we term eternal death? I shall be obliged for help out of difficulty. You, you question, your question goes to the root of the matter and touches the very heart of the gospel, and I am glad to help you with the testimony of God's word. Let us start with the apostle's statement that by one man sin entered into the world and death by sin. And so death passed upon all men, for that all have sin. This is sufficient to establish the fact that death is indeed the fruit of sin. But for sin, there never would have been any death in the world. Just here, you may perhaps ask the question that so often is asked. What kind of death is it that is the result of sin? The answer is simply death. There are not two kinds of death, any more than there are two kinds of life. True, the Bible speaks of the first death and the second death, but there are not two kinds of death, but death at two different times. Will you be so kind to explain your statement? When Adam fell, he brought the race of mankind under the sentence of eternal death, signs of the times, uh, um, July 7, 1890. With the fact that he did not die an eternal death, did he suffer less than the penalty of the law? In answer to the second question, we answer yes, and that really answers the whole. If Adam suffered the penalty of the law, he would have died an eternal death, for the wages of sin is death. This means death simply, uh, this means death simply and absolute with no hope of resurrection. The penalty of the law has fallen upon only on one living, and that was Christ. But he did not die an eternal death. No, he died for us that we might be partakers of uh, his life. Maybe one more, and then now we go to the omnis. Uriah Smith, here and after. But immediately upon Adam's failure under the first arrangement, supervene the plan of salvation through Jesus Christ. Before the first penalty was fully carried out, there was time for Adam to have another trial. And through the intervention of Christ, this opportunity was given him. There was promised a seed of the woman who should bruise the serpent's head. Adam was placed upon a new probation. In the promised seed, the Redeemer, a new hope was set before him, and he was taught how to manifest faith in the Redeemer by typical services and sacrifices and offerings. This arrangement also looked forward into the future and included all Adam's posterity, else we had no hope. A pertinent inquiry now arises, namely, how could the descendant of death already rented be inflicted upon the whole human family so that there should be no sacrifice of authority, principle, or prestige on the part of God, and yet the new blessing of hope of life through Christ be placed within their reach. It could be done in this way. Let men live, and without any reference to their own personal action, let them die in Adam, as the apostle assures that they do. This fulfills the Adamic uh, uh, penalty of the Adamic sin under the Adamic covenant. Then let all men, irrespective of character, be brought by Christ out of from this condition of Adamic death into which they fell through no fault of their own once more to the plane of life and being then alive beyond the extreme limits of the effects of the Adamic covenant and fall and death penalty. Nothing remains but they answer for their own course of conduct and receive such a destiny as shall be determined thereby. So in short, what the pioneers are saying that uh, when people die, what we call this death 
that uh, has natural occurrence, it is uh, the consequences of Adam falling. But then the penalty of still, sin still stands, which is the second death. But because they have renounced their sins, they do suffer consequences of sin, but Christ took the penalty of sin for those who acknowledge Christ and they will never suffer the penalty of sin. So uh, it is not first or second, but actually the consequences and the penalty thereof. I hope until that point, we are somehow clear the things that cannot be understood. Maybe you can raise a question or an objection, a contribution as we go into the last 30 minutes of the omnis of Jesus Christ, if Jesus Christ had the omnis when he was on earth. Is there a contribution question or uh, any other understanding? Manuel McKean, welcome. Yeah, uh, there is there is a quote you read from J M uh, J M Stephenson that uh, concerning I don't know is it, was it original the, uh, I don't know I don't know if you can go back does that quote that uh, the death due to original sin I think what uh, I, uh, I don't know if you can be able to find it this is James Stephenson the yeah, atonement yeah. page nine yeah, paragraph one. The penalty of God's law for original sin is death. Now, uh, is this term original sin the same as the orthodox view of the original sin? No, uh, no, no, no. <laughs> yeah. The pioneers did not believe in a marketing conception. Okay, so that was my first question. Okay. And then, uh, there is this statement I, uh, we find from the writings of Illinois. I don't know if it's the South page 25, which says that. Uh, Christ took the death which was ours uh, that we may do it, that we might receive the life which was his. I don't know if those are the exact words or something related to that. Now, which death is uh, now when she says that Christ took the death which was ours, what type of death is she referring to? Is it just death or does it, uh, does it have any reference to the first and second death in quotes? And then to help us understand that, my question is now. What is this first? What is this second death and first death in quotes? Does it refer to their nature or to the order in which they occur in reference to each other? Uh, thank you, Brother Manuel. And uh, what you are asking is in DA twenty five point two, Christ was treated as we deserve that we might be treated as he deserves. He was condemned for our sins in which he had no share, that we might be justified by his righteousness in which we had no share. He suffered the death which was ours, that we might receive the life which was his with the stripes we are healed. So you ask that uh, which death is this? The death that Romans talks about, the penalty of sin, the choice for each individual to sin. Um, the, 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 the death which you actually, people are struggling with the first death. I know people struggle with the first death. It is actually, uh, uh, what can I say? There is no second death without the first death. So it is in order. And why do I say that? You understand there are people who will be resurrected without seeing death. So, the first death is just first in order because you die. Both the righteous and the wicked die. And that first death is not the penalty of sin. Uh, it is just a consequence that Adam fell. And so actually that condition finds ourselves in. And if you could have not sinned, then we could live forever. There is nothing like first and second death. But uh, I don't know, maybe it can be just uh, nuances and semantics, but I believe there is no second death without the first death. People will suffer the first death and uh, it is not necessarily they go through the second death. It is just uh, 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 in order because when Christ comes, the wicked will suffer the first death 
when the a thousand years are ended, they suffer the second death. But the second death is inclusive of the total annihilation from God, which is the uh, 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 um, the rejection of God's mercy. And now Christ actually died. The death he died for us, actually it was not even because of the consequences of Adam falling. So it cannot be referred to first death. No, Christ never suffered the first death. I cannot, maybe if we say first, but uh, it will be just that uh, in order, but uh, uh, I don't want to mix myself. But Christ did not suffer because of the consequences of sin, which may happen because we may not live until Jesus Christ comes. Jesus did not die the second death because it is the total separation from God. Jesus paid the price of death, the penalty of sin, and the first and second death we'll never find in uh, the spirit of prophecy. And so uh, he tested what the sinner who have refused Jesus Christ will go to. But, be, uh, but uh, because we have accepted him, now we shall not test, uh, we shall not experience the same. I don't know if it makes things difficult, Makini, or I don't. Yeah, actually, actually, I've, I've just read something from the same book. Uh, I think, let me just read it loud, yeah? Yeah. Uh, it's, it's the same book, Atonement, yeah, I think this is page eight, paragraph five. Uh-huh. The second, state, the second sentence says, they are, denom they are denominated by some writers a first and second death, but the terms first and second are relative terms, pointing out the order in which the events uh, specified occur. And also the last statement in the same, in the same paragraph says that, uh, let me just get it. We call the one that occurs first a first death and the one that occurs second a second death just as we speak of the first and second life, a first and second birth, and a first and second Adam, simply to denote their order and not their nature. I, I think that makes it very clear. Thank you. I'm glad. I'm really glad that uh, some of these things we are coming into consensus. Thank you so much. And so allow me to go to the last, the fourth issue, and which is the last one. Yes. Just a little bit. Uh, I, I just wanted to add this. Yes. Because Go ahead. Christ, oh, Christ, Christ is not sinning, ha made it impossible for the graves to hold him. So if the graves could not hold him and the, the Lord imputed that sin on him, him going to the grave could not really hold him. Even the devil could not hold him. So God really, even in the promise that he had given him in the council of peace, had to resurrect him because God lives by his rules. And Christ not sinning, he had to resurrect him. That's, that's how I can actually add it uh, in relation to Psalm 16, 8 to 11, which is where we read those of... Um, uh, he could not leave his body to see corruption because he did not sin. That's what I wanted to add. Thank you so much. I go to... Let me, let me quickly, let me say, that's very bold of Junior. <laughs> <laughs> it reminds me of the language of Paul in, in Hebrews chapter 1 and 2. Paul is telling God, it behooved that he had to make Christ like us. <laughs> that's interesting. Praise the Lord. Now, I like to bring in my submission and um, I'm of the idea that Christ had his omnis, but um, he laid them down in him, but they, they were dormant and they were not to be used by, uh, for relieving his own uh, 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 wants. And so uh, I'll try to bring in my submission why I believe that he had the three omnis. I'll start here in uh, 5 BC 1129.3. The human did not take the place of the divine, nor the divine of the human. This is the mystery of goldness. The two expression human and divine were in Christ closely and inseparably one, and yet they had a distinct individuality. Through Christ, uh, although, though Christ humbled himself to become man, the Godhead was still his own. 
his deity could not be lost. So uh, you find that two natures are in Jesus Christ, the divinity and the human, but uh, distinct individuality, each maintaining its own. And he didn't have to tap into his divinity for anything because he had to demonstrate. He did not come to demonstrate what God could come to do, but what uh, man could do. And so uh, this was the greatest temptation that Christ had, that he had powers that he could not use. And so all of his miracles were done by the ministration of the angels uh, when he asked the father to do them. Uh, he relied on the father to be able to do everything, and then the father could use the angels to do everything. And so the greatest temptation that Christ had is to use his omnipowers, but here he succeeded. And uh, I also like to add some few things uh, uh, on what um, uh, that uh, really, uh, how I, I come to believe that 2SP 92.2. The circumstances and surrounding of Christ were such as to make temptation upon this point peculiarly aggravating. The long fast had physically debilitated him. The pangs of hunger consumed his vitals. His fainting system clamored for food. He could have wrought a miracle. That is the sign of omnipotence. He could have wrought a miracle uh, in his own behalf and satisfied his knowing hunger. But this would not have been in a accordance with the divine plan. It was not part of his mission to exercise divine power for his own benefit. This he never did in his earthly life. His miracles were all for good for others. And we understand that all his miracles were done by the angels. Another thing, uh, this is uh, confrontation page 44, paragraph two. Uh, from fallen man, when brought to into straight places, could not have the power to work miracles in his own behalf, to save himself from pain or anguish, that is fallen man, or to give himself victory over his enemies. It was the promised purpose of God to test and prove the rest and give them an opportunity to develop character by bringing them frequently into the trying position to test their faith and confidence in his love and power. The life of Christ was a perfect pattern. He was ever by his example and teaching, teaching man that God was his dependence and that in him should be his faith and firm trust. And so you find that if man could not exercise power, so Christ was not allowed to exercise his powers so that uh, humanity may have a perfect example. Another submission, uh, DA 119.3. And Christ was not to exercise divine power for his own benefit. Just looking at this, you, you, you start seeing the presence of the omnipotence in him and these three omnis. Uh, another one is RH, May 14, 1908, paragraph four. Coming to the son of God, the great deceiver claimed to be commissioned by the father with a message to the savior. He need no lo longer hunger. If thou be the son of God, command that these stones be made bread. But by such an act as this, Christ would have broken his promise that he will never exercise his divine power in order to escape any difficulty or suffering that man in his hum humility must meet. So Christ, when he was tempted by Satan, he could not go to heaven to bring those powers. He had them in him but he did not tap into that individuality that existed. He had the distinct individuality of divinity and the distinct uh, individuality of humanity, but he did not tap into the divinity. He did, and he didn't have to summon them from heaven. He could exercise them, but if he could exercise them, then we are being told he could have broken his own promise to the father that he will never exercise that. Just like uh, the father lives at home and tells the child, please don't play with the TV. And the father goes away or they are separated. And the son, the greatest temptation is when his program, actually the time of his program is there, uh, has come and he cannot do anything. The TV is there, but because he promised the father, I cannot do that. The TV remains there, he is there with it, but he can do nothing because he has promised his father 
not to turn on that TV. Another thing is uh, this, throughout his life on earth, this is Bible Echo, November 15, 1892, paragraph two. Throughout his life on earth, his power must be exercised for the good of suffering humanity alone. So he had the power, but actually he didn't do it for his own sake, but to relieve uh, 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 the human uh, uh, ones. And uh, this is uh, 16 MR. The divine nature combined with the human made him capable of yielding to certain temptations. Here, the test to Christ was far greater than that of Adam and Eve. What made the temptation of Christ greater? It is because he had the power in him that humanity did not have, that distinct individuality of uh, uh, divinity, the divine nature. Man do not have the divine nature. That is why the temptation of Adam and Eve could not be stronger than that of Christ. That Christ's temptation was greater because he had a power in himself, which he could have practiced, but um, he did not practice it. In ending, I'll also, I, I found something today morning, which really was compelling. I don't know if anyone have ever seen this. Uh, I'm not bragging, but uh, this was new to me. If you have seen it, well and good. But uh, if you have never seen it, I think it is so, uh, new to me and uh, it was really uh, shocking to see this in the morning. Uh, <clears throat> this is MS 163-1898. It says, he took humanity upon him, but he did not leave his divinity. He closed his divinity with humanity. That is what I see, that Christ had three omnis. He did not leave them to heaven. They lay there dormant. He took humanity upon himself in order to carry humanity through the commandment, keeping people to give the testimony to the whole universe of heaven. He stood in humanity to bear all the battles and conflicts as our head, thus elevating with God every human being on the face of the earth. Now Christ took humanity that humanity might take his divinity. He took our nature that he might give to human nature his nature. He has passed over the place where Adam fell, and redeemed Adam's fall. Every reasoning power, every particle of discernment, discrimination, every action of the mind that God has given man, exercise it and not be like a leaf that can be blown by every wind, hither and thither. So Christ took humanity, but he did not live in heaven divinity. What he was stripped when he came down was the outside glory and the crown. But the powers, the three omnis, it was in him as divinity as a distinct individuality, but never exercise them. Another quote that I found, this, this ones that I'm giving today, I found them just today. This one that I'm reading lastly, I found them today. Jesus frequently spent all night in prayer, his humanity taking hold on the divinity of his father, from which source came fresh supplies of restoring power to exercise on behalf of the sick and afflicted. We need the Holy Spirit's power, the calm assurance of faith that can claim God's promise. So Christ never attempted to tap in his divinity, but actually ask the Father, ask the Father's divinity to be the source of fresh supplies for his strength. So the Father could outpour the Spirit to his Son, but Christ was not to reach unto his own divinity that was in him that he brought with but he had to ask the father. If he had tapped on his own, then he could have broken the council of peace. Another one uh, this morning is this, very, uh, 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 very amazing. Christ had commenced his work. He had laid the foundation and he will not leave it incomplete. That is, and you know that when he was laying this foundation, he was, um, uh, he had, um, uh, all the powers, all the three omnis. And then we are told he laid the foundation and he will not leave it incomplete as an unfinished economy. By the side of his father, he would put his hand to the work and carry it forward to completion. And the Holy Spirit, Christ's representative, will put into the hearts and on the lips of those who will believe on him a testimony of crucified and risen savior, which men will not be able to gainsay or resist. Now look at this. The divine teacher 
would exercise his power in larger measure now. So when Christ resurrected after finishing the work, now he could exercise his power in a larger measure. Meaning when he was on earth, he could not exercise that power, that divinity in a larger measure because he was cumbered with humanity and they had entered into the council of peace. But now he is released from uh, the finished work and he has succeeded. When he goes back to heaven, the prophet says he could now exercise his power, exercise, you know, he was not allowed to exercise divine power when he was here to some extent, but now he is allowed to exercise it to a larger extent after his resurrection. I think the last one, yes, the last one, MS 15, coming to the son of God, the great deceiver claimed to be commissioned by the father with a message to the savior. He need no longer hunger. If thou be the son of God, command that the stones be made bread. But by such an act as this, Christ will have broken his promise that he will never exercise his divine power. You see the previous say, power, uh, quote says, he now could exercise this divine power. But um, in this quote, he could not exercise when he was on earth, but we are told he did not leave divinity. Now, uh, our elder brother Ngasa said that, uh, um, Christ, when he died, did not see through the portals of the tomb. I can say as a human being, he laid on hold of the promises of prophecy. And he didn't have to tap into omniscience to know that his sacrifice has been accepted. The father who had his omniscience active and could be tapped in knew that the sacrifice had been accepted. But now the son could not be allowed to tap into his omniscience to reveal if he could see that the sacrifice had been accepted. He still had to rely on the father to reveal to him if the sacrifice had been accepted. And so he did not fully exercise the powers that actually the father had given unto him. And when Christ really resurrected, uh, we are told when he died, all that comprised him died uh, uh, actually lay in the grave, not died, but laid in the grave with him. And then when the angel came, he resurrected him with the life that was in him, the original and borrowed and derived. And then uh, 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 Christ was not given anything new apart from giving back that outside glory and the crown which he had laid aside. But the very powers that were laid dormant or were not exercised when we saw, was on earth were in him and then now were to, started to be exercised in a larger measure. That is how I understand things and uh, I'm here for discussion and I will welcome your submission and your contribution and your question. Thank you. Can you can you add to that contribution as in see oh, <coughs> Hello Dickens I think we have a problem with Dickens uh, Let him go ahead Yes go ahead go ahead let him go ahead. <laughs> oh, Brother Junius, go ahead. Okay, I, I wanted to add to that that you just said. If I am to look at Christ and uh, look at the sanctuary, looking at really the Ark of the Testament, I see it as in the inner side of it, it's coated with gold, which is what you're speaking about. Then there is the acacia tree which is his humanity and now the revealing or after the resurrection the revealing of the actual inside of the gold plating outside so i am i'm, I'm appreciating this truth thank you very much and also maybe we can say that um, christ had omnipresent and did not uh, exercise omnipresent what is actually omnipresence when now uh, you read Psalms 1, uh, is it 137, that uh, the spirit of God 
is what actually does the omnipresence. Jesus never practiced to go and uh, really be at a certain place at the same time he be in this place. He never exercised that, but he was a human. He, when he was called to go and heal the sick, he did not send his other part. He did not split himself into two. Jesus Christ was not a split. He did not split himself that the spirit goes and he remains in a local place doing the work. He had to go at that place during the resurrection of uh, Lazarus, during the healing of the son of Jairus, uh, and during the widow of Nain. All these things he had to go there locally because he could simply uh, speak a word and then uh, or uh, uh, be in a spirit uh, or I don't know what to explain because I don't want to enter into the temptation of uh, dissembled beings. There is nothing like dissembled being because the Holy Spirit is uh, the, the, the presence of the Father and the Son where they cannot be there uh, uh, locally or literally because they have to be at a place literally and locally. And so Christ uh, had to do things as a human being could do. He didn't have to tap into the omnipresence of the spirit, although he had the spirit of the father in fullness. Him who the father has sent, he has the spirit. And uh, it pleased the father that the Godhead should dwell in him bodily, uh, all the fullness of the, the, the Godhead. Now, what is the fullness of the Godhead that the father has? It, it, it encompasses all the omnis. And the father was pleased that all this should be, uh, should dwell in him. But uh, then uh, he had not to exercise them. He can exercise them. He is on throne with a, a, a glorified body as we saw yesterday. But again, now he can exercise the omnipresence of uh, his Holy Spirit by being uh, 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 the, the, the minister of the church on the earth. Any other submission? Hello? Yes, Dickens. Uh, Dickens, go ahead. Are you getting me? I wanted to, to share something. I wanted to share something about the power of discernment. Uh, there is a place where Christ is telling Nathaniel that when you are under the, the tree, I saw you. <clears throat> the many people have been using this to say that uh, Christ could be in one place yet and be in another place. But I think, see the case of Misha with Gehazi. <clears throat> Elias is also telling Gehazi that while you are in the way, uh, I saw you. So I think this is the power of discernment because Christ could read the, uh, the mind of men. Uh, but just I think it was through the gift of discernment. I don't know if that is. My thought is right. Thank you. Brother Dickens, I have to challenge you on that. Because there is a quote that Sister White says, Jesus spent all uh, some part of all the night, I uh, spent all the night or some part of the night to commune with his father of what shall be during the day and the what he shall be doing. And so the the, 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 the place that you are saying in John chapter one, he tells Nathaniel uh, this in John chapter one, uh, verses, uh, verses uh, 50, Jesus said uh, unto him, because I said unto thee, uh, I saw thee under the fig tree, believeth thou, thou shalt see greater things than this. Oh, in verse 47, he says, Jesus saw Nathanael coming to him and said unto him, Behold, an Israel indeed, whom is no God. John 1, 47. Nathanael said unto him, When knoweth thou me? Jesus answered and said unto him, Before that Philip calleth thee, be, when thou was under the fig, I saw thee. 49, Nathanael answers and said unto him, Rabbi, thou art the son of God, thou art the king of Israel. Jesus answered and said unto him, because I said unto thee, I saw thee under the fig tree, believeth thou, thou shalt see greater things than this. And he said unto him, verily I say unto you, hereafter you shall see heaven open and angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. Now remember, every man has a guardian angel and they take the reports in heaven. 
Jesus could have had a privy in the guardian angel of, uh, of Nathaniel and gotten the information because he did not exercise his omnipresence. And so the father could have revealed to him or the report the angel had given about Nathaniel uh, uh, or when Christ was in heaven, which actually we are denying that when he came, he did not exercise his omni. So in his morning prayers, the father could have revealed unto him, you see, there's somebody that will come to you. And he was under a fig tree. And uh, I'll try to find that quote and share it as we continue with the submissions. Hey, Brother Sami. Yes, Brother Ngasa, welcome. Yeah, I was uh, allowing uh, brethren to give some submissions, reactions to you um, before I come in, knowing that um, uh, I'll, uh, my thoughts will be a bit different from what you hold. So I, I, I'm still taking time to listen before I come in. I don't know, um, but I could go ahead now. I don't know if someone still needed to react to that. Is there someone before I try to speak? Someone else? I, I wanted to say that before you speak, that um, Brother Sammy's submission that Christ had those powers but did not exercise them um, somewhat makes me think really about uh, about death, the death of Christ. If Christ had all those powers, would he die? That's a question that I'm really asking myself because the omnis are actually about divinity. They are about divinity. And so divinity, one of the things that defines divinity is the ability to have life, self-existent life, and also the ability to give life, which we know Christ did give. And so we, I'm really thinking, if we are saying that all the omnis were with Christ, but not exercised, um, how would we say that about his death? It takes us back to his death. Uh, how do we reconcile this with the earlier part which we have just finished about the death of Christ. Uh, that is just one of the questions. There are many others, but that is one of the immediate ones that comes to mind. And I'm also thinking about Christ as a child. As a child, I know from B.A. that there's a, a chapter that's dedicated to that, that Christ had to be taught the things that he had taught. Uh, that makes us go back to the nature of Christ, which I missed. But uh, I don't know whether you tackle the omnis when you are talking about the nature of Christ. Think about Christ sitting at his mother's feet at being taught the things that he had taught the prophets before. What, how do, do the omnis reconcile with that? Those are some of the thoughts that come to my mind. But uh, immediately, I, I could talk about the others later, but those are the ones that are immediately in my mind. Thank you, Brother Dan. And uh, I think that doesn't distract from uh, actually the, the issue of death and the issue of Jesus Christ being taught. We understand that Christ did not have to tap into his divinity. And so he had to be taught everything as a human. He came into knowing things as a human. And so that does not distract from the issue of uh, his mother, uh, as I understand teaching him. Because uh, if he could have tapped into divinity, then he could have known everything. And there would have not been uh, the issue that uh, he grew in wisdom, in stature, in favor with God and man. And so when we are talking about Jesus Christ being taught, the things he had taught in the Old Testament, we are talking about the human Jesus Christ. Remember, uh, it is that Christ had the two individuality in him, the divine and the human. And the divine did not need to be taught anything. Neither did Mary beget divine to teach divinity, uh, to teach it. Mary begot humanity. 
and then he had to do his responsibility, even as a parent does his responsibility to teach his human children the things. Talking about his death, actually, you find that uh, it, it comes, it, it uh, really uh, um, uh, boils to the same thing that Christ could have said that I, can, I am not going to die. He could have refused it. E.G. Uh, White says that uh, in the Garden of Gethsemane, Gethsemane, when he was talking about that um, uh, uh, the, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak, uh, actually, he could have broke forth from carrying the burden of sin. And the father uh, 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 could have allowed that, but that could have not been the counsel that they had agreed upon on. But Sister White, I remember very well saying that uh, Christ could have really refused it there in the Garden of Gethsemane. And so he could have, he had power to refuse death as God, but he had again to humble himself and uh, be able to finish up the counsel of peace that they had agreed with his father. He will not exercise anything. Just as in the temptation, he could not make breads, but he had power. So even he could have refused death, but he did not refuse it. And we saw that in, uh, in uh, making the stones be bread, he could have done it. He didn't have to summon the power from heaven. He had not left divinity in heaven. He could have done it, but he didn't do it. So even uh, refusing death, he could have refused it because there was life in him, original and borrowed immortality, and he could have exercised it. But um, uh, because this was the plan of redemption, Christ had to lay the life dormant into the grave and uh, accept the father to complete the plan of uh, redemption. Brother Dickens, I found something as Eldangasa comes in, and it is something beautiful. And really, uh, I apologize maybe for putting you off like that, that um, Christ could have revealed, been revealed something with the father or the angels. But uh, I then recollected my mind so quickly and so thought that I will look at the verse again in, in John chapter one. And so this is my apology to Brother Dickens that uh, this had slipped out of my mind. And uh, 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 I had a conjecture there that the angels of the divine or the father could have revealed unto him. But uh, I want you to see this in connection with what uh, Brother Dickens was saying and correct my statement then that um, actually it borders towards what Brother Dickens had said that uh, Christ could discern something. Take your Bibles. This is pamphlet 22.2. Take your Bibles, humble yourself, and weep and fast and pray before the Lord, as did Nathaniel seeking to know the truth. Jesus' divine eye saw Nathaniel praying and answered his prayer. I think that is something that I have to think about, and not only to think about, but to accept what the prophet says. Jesus' divine eye saw Nathaniel praying. Welcome, Brother Angas. Thank you very much. Um, I will quickly respond to that. In fact, the moment you point that Jesus' divine eye, it can only mean angels. If we now have studied about the eyes of the Lord. Yes. Now, if um, they, it is not like Jesus was standing there and then in his, um, in his um, omniscience, because that, that's only what it can mean in his omniscience that he saw Nathanael. No, this is literal Jesus standing here. Nathanael under a literal tree somewhere where Jesus doesn't know um, that that happened. And sorry. Um, um, so that we have to be careful there to be sure that it is the angel's ministry there. That is Number one, we may understand that all the miracles that Christ did were here. I will only quickly ask that question so that I can place that under a miracle. Now, is it a normal thing for me to see a person under a tree who's 10 kilometers away? No, it's not a normal thing. Um, that's a miracle. And, and it's not discernment. You know, there's discernment. Um, when I am with you, uh, 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 when I'm with people around me, and I'm used to, I, I can discern certain things. If I see, for example, um, um, a girl and boy behave that's in a certain ways I can look and discern no that's that's not right 
I, 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 sometimes someone can walk your way and you feel um, that's not the kind of proper guy. But of course, again, we'll still bring the administration of angels there. So, but on the matter of Nathanael, I will squarely place it to the ministry of angels um, without, without really uh, doubting there. Because that was a miracle. Remember, that was not a miracle for Jesus, but a miracle for the sake of Nathanael for him to receive salvation. So it wasn't for Jesus, it was for Nathanael. And all miracles that Jesus did on behalf of other people were not for Jesus himself. They were for those people. And then that big quote in DA, page 143, page 144 there, that every miracle that Christ did was the power of the Father exercised through the ministration of angels. So that is where I will place that one there. But now coming, com coming to the issues of the omnis. Um, this is a matter I love addressing. Um, I love addressing, putting all the scriptures together. Now, where will I, if I was to, before we come to the quotations, and uh, I will just to pick a few, then we check, and address the big issue. Now, what is divinity? What is divinity? We will have to define from there. What is begin, uh, divinity? You took us through the many quotes, which are very important, uh, showing us, we, we had that one, deity did not sink, the deity did not sink, then deity sunk. We also see divinity did not die, and we were able to carefully understand that when deity did not sink, we knew it was the father. Where we read deity sunk, we knew it is the son, and that we settled. So now, on the omnis, I will quickly rush to um, uh, Hebrews chapter 2, the entire chapter. Hebrews chapter 2. I will not go into the details because it's just of time. Hebrews chapter 2. Now, when the Bible says, uh, the Bible speaks of Christ laying down his life, when the Bible speaks of Christ being subject to death, when Sister White puts all those quotations, I've not ordered them for now, um, what does it mean? Were these things happening here or they happened before he came? So the biggest matter here on this study is to check what things happened then and then what were here when he was here. Look here. When he came here, did he come with the ability to sin? Now, we know the one aspect of divinity is that divinity does not sin completely. You cannot tempt divinity because God says, um, um, when man is tempted, let him not say he can be tempted of God. Um, the other verses that I've, so I've said, Hebrews chapter 2. The other place I will check is Philippians chapter 2. Now, the last part I will check is all the verses in John which speak of, um, I can of my own self do nothing. Do nothing. I, on, on my own self, I can do nothing. Now, but because of time, I will perhaps, uh, maybe, uh, um, I, will, I will ask an opportunity next time maybe not now, maybe in a week's time or so I prepare, then I can present these thoughts and then we, we can look at that. But quickly, let's just place a quotation there. You can help me, Brother Sami. Let's yes. place a quotation there. Um, and the biggest issue will be for me the question of immortality. The only is I'm willing to be tolerant. I'm willing to be tolerant that uh, uh, if a brother said there were omnis in there lying dormant, I'm willing to let that be. But the big issue here will be the question of immortality, which I'll address as I, I, as I finish. Just type again that quotation of repost, page 336, deserve ages. Oh, thank you. B.A.? Uh, 336. 336.1. Yeah. Can you see it? I, oh, I can't see it there. You can't see it. Give, me, my, two seconds. Give me two seconds. Can you see it? No. Yeah. Now, let me read it. When Jesus was awakened to meet the storm, he was in perfect peace. There was no trace of fear in word or look, for no fear was in his heart. But he rested not in the position of almighty power. So he rested not in the position of almighty power. It was not as the master of earth and sea and sky that he reposed in quiet. That power he had laid down he had laid down. So we have to, when had he laid down? Was it at that moment when he was just sleeping or it was before even he came to that moment? That power, I will speak, I will say the latter will be correct, that that power he had laid down before even that moment. So we have to check when did he lay that power? 
at what point did he lay that power down? That power he had laid down, and he says, I can of my own self do nothing, John 5.30. He, tr he trusted in the Father's might. It was in faith, faith in God's love and care that Jesus rested. And the power of the one... Uh, it seems like we've lost Brother Patrick. Angasa? We've lost Patrick a bit. Patrick, we can't hear you. But Patrick is expressing the same point that I did express about uh, the omnis as far as death is concerned. Did Christ have immortality here? That is the question that I believe Elder Patrick is also asking here because he had laid down his divine, his omni, let me say the omni of relating to death, his immortality, he had laid it down. He had laid it down. That's, I believe, what Elder Patrick is also trying to express. But let's see if he comes. Hello, to... hello, Brother Dan. Yes. Did I hear you say that there's an omni of uh, immortality? Yes of Christ possessing immortality. Is that an omni? Omni, I think there are three things, omnipresence, omnipotent, mm -hmm. and uh, omniscience, or you are placing immortality under omnipotence? Yes. Oh, I get you. Yes. Could we get Elder Patrick back? I don't know what has happened to him, because I believe he's, he's expressing something that is not, he's not finished. Not quite finished it. He's still here. Is he still here with us or he's not there? I can't see him. I can't see him. I don't know. He's logged off. Okay, let me try and reach him on phone. Okay, thank you. As uh, you try to reach him, uh, we were just talking about um, as you try to uh, to reach uh, the brother, we were talking about um, Jesus seeing Nathaniel with the divine eye. And uh, I can't do a much quarrel on that if the divine eye is the angels, because um, uh, uh, Jesus Christ could, be, uh, could commune with the father and the father could uh, 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 show him in the future, not through the angels, but he had some direct communication with the father when he was on earth. And so he could commune with the father and the father could help him see somehow in the future. And it was not necessarily by angels. So all miracles, uh, I don't know if I can place that as a miracle or I don't know how we understand what is a miracle. I believe that was a mystery, but not a miracle. Maybe we can check on that, what is a miracle, but I believe when it comes to seeing Nathaniel, it was a mystery that the humanity of Jesus Christ or uh, Christ could be able to see someone. But because he was in communion with the father, the father could have shown him. And though even the world that Dickens used to be son uh, cannot be the, uh, the world that we are talking about, but uh, the father through showing him the, uh, the, the, the things of the day, uh, he could have seen Nathaniel uh, before actually uh, he was uh, he came to him and uh, it doesn't have to be through the angels. That is only what I wanted to uh, add on that. Brother Dan, have you got him? Sorry, sorry, I, I don't know. <laughs> thank you, thank you. I don't know what happened with my connection, no problem. But Brother Sami, I've got a new there directly. Yes. Um, either way, we know that Father could minister directly to Christ because Christ committed no sin. So there, there's no problem again. Um, either way, whether we say by angels, uh, I don't know what we'll call a mystery there, Brother Sami. It's okay. Yes. But um, either way, it wasn't Christ having some ability that did not come from the Father that he saw Nathanael. That one I, needs to be kept. I, I, fully, I, I fully agree with you, Eldangas. I fully agree with so you. you that, I fully agree that Jesus could not do anything of his own without the revelation from the Father and the angels. Very good. 
So, um, so if, if, if in that case one wants to take it as a direct ministration to the son, I wouldn't deny it because we know that uh, the father will, was able to minister his spirit directly to Christ um, because Christ sinned not, and we saw that even at baptism. Um, uh, I will still uh, request everyone to check whether will that, will that fall into a miracle? Um, will that really fall into a miracle? We need to check that. And was that for the sake of Christ or for the sake of Nathanael? And if it was, if we answer the question that it was for the sake of Nathanael, then I will quickly go to Desire of Ages. Let me see whether I have my copy here. Let me just get uh, quickly. Anyone rush to that page 143? Um, rush to page 143. Uh, that chapter is called, um, the chapter is called, uh, found, um, what do we call it? Um, we have found him. Let me see whether I can find page 143. I have it here. I have it here. Page 143, Desire of Ages. So we, we just need to be sure. It doesn't matter whether it was, uh, even if it was by the Father or by angels, it will, not, it will not make a difference because we know the Father was capable of ministering to Christ directly, unlike us. I, uh, there's no way the Father will minister to us directly because we always need a mediator because of sin. Now, look at what I read. The angels of God are ever passing from earth to heaven and from heaven to earth. The miracles of Christ for the afflicted and suffering were wrought by the power of God. So by the power of God, by the power of God, through the ministration of angels. So through the ministration of angels. And it is through Christ by the ministration of his heavenly messengers that every blessing come from God to us. In taking upon himself humanity, our Savior unites his interest with those of the fallen sons and daughters of Adam while through his divinity grasps the throne of God and thus Christ is the medium of communication of, of man with God and God with man. Um, let me read the paragraph up there a little bit. Here Christ virtually says on the bank of the Jordan, the heavens were open, the spirit descended like a dove upon me. That sin was but a token that I am the son of God. If you believe on me as such, your faith shall be quickened. You shall see that heavens are open and are never to be closed. I have opened them to you. The angels of God are ascending, bearing the prayers of the needy and distressed to the Father above and descending, bringing blessing and hope, courage, help, and life to the children of men. Now, if the Father ministered directly to Christ or by angels, we have no problem. But if we accept that immediately, it will bring the question of um, omniscience, uh, or knowing, or being omnipresent. Now, the fact that we must bring the Father or angels will immediately address the point that Christ was not able there by himself to see Nathanael under the tree. Amen. Now, and another point which we need to make, when Christ read the thoughts of people, then reading thoughts will fall under omniscience. Reading, you know, that, that secret which you have kept, in, when, when you have a secret and someone else is able to know the secret which you have, then that is, that is the ability of being omniscient, knowing the things which, like the Bible says, um, no man knoweth the things of another man, save the spirit of that man in him. So, but God knoweth everything because his spirit is all-knowing. Now, was that Christ, is that how Christ was here? Uh, we said they were, it was dormant. But the quote, what I was reading, I don't know what Brother Sammy will say. And what is to lay down? Because there are three words we will be struggling with here. To lay down to veil, uh, which is that other word, uh, to cloth. So now, when we say that power was laid down, now it's, it speaks to the past. Which past is this? Up to what point do we run this path? When had he laid down that power? So that when he, 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 when he slept there, what is to lay down? Was it something you are inside yourself so that you, 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 you have it, but it is in you? What is to lay down? Now, and to tie to that, the biggest problem, I'm, I'm, I'm again saying, the omnis I'll be very comfortable to, to accept, um, even though that's not what I believe at the moment, but I will take a brother who believes the omnis with Christ, while with Christ, some are, I will be tolerant and willing to learn. But the biggest question on this matter, because divinity, we have, we have tried to define divinity in the past. Divinity is not equal to immortality, but divinity is totality of what
Oh, we have lost. I believe to forgive sin. Okay. Yeah. Divinity will contain such things as ability to create, forgive sins, know all things, incapability of dying, and all that. Now, so do we, what things was Christ stripped of when he came here? We have accepted the forms of the glories of the form of God, that one we have accepted. Now, did he have the ability of not being tempted? Because that's part of divinity, because divinity cannot be tempted. As, so God, now, as God, he could not be tempted, but as human, he could be tempted. Now, okay, that's where some of my understanding will come in. As God, when? Because Christ was here, not as God. Because I'm saying in heaven, as God, he could not be tempted. But here, he was as man, so he could be tempted. But anyways, um, my biggest point there uh, that I will maybe, let's leave the omnis, I go and prepare for that and, and, and bring a presentation. Quickly want us to address the issue of immortality. Yes. Uh, well, and even, uh, let, let's, uh, can, we, uh, can we check one more quote? I yes, showed the, which, the quote on that. Uh, can you check the quote on divested of humanity? It will be now everywhere. D.A. Kampard, is this 671? Yeah. Kampard? With humanity. 669, I'm sorry, not 671. Just cast it there. Okay, two seconds, I'll be there. Do you see it? Is uh, Eldangasa still with us? I think we have like, uh, we have extended to 17 minutes. We have like uh, five minutes to wrap it up, but we are really losing Eldangasa. Eldadan, are you there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, sorry for that. Uh, yeah, yeah. Wait, wait, okay, okay. Now I see it, I see it. Sorry for that. No, look, here. let me read it. The Holy Spirit is Christ's representative, but divested of the personality of humanity and independent thereof. Come back with humanity. Christ could not be in every place personally. Now, when was he come back with humanity? As soon as he partook humanity. So this quotation here does not say, does not suggest to me that that was dormant in him. But this one shows total incapability. Combat with and why was the, why is there total uh, uh, incapability of the same? Because he is combat with humanity. Now, how was Christ now? Uh, and we know we know being everywhere present does not mean splitting like Indians teach. We know being everywhere present by his spirit, and being everywhere present by the agency of his holy angels. Spirit here speaking of omniscience. and by spirit omnipresence we can study that uh, i will invite everyone to go and study that document which i said again yesterday that is personality of god by james white so god is everywhere present by two ways his omniscience sitting in heaven where he is and his mind knowing everything so he's everywhere present and secondly by the agency of his spirit which is manifested in all his works right that we can find in that document so combat with humanity christ could not be you know this is absolute english here combat with humanity christ could not be in every place personally but now once once the and when the cumbrance of humanity is removed then he can be everywhere present and that only happened once he was glorified so now we are in fact here we are addressing in this just one point here addresses two issues omniscience and omnipresence because omniscience and omnipresence is by the way is how uh, god is everywhere present and um i don't know uh, if i could easily get uh, that document on pago i will show you that that is how god is everywhere present but now combat with humanity christ could not be everywhere present personally therefore it was for their interest that he should go to the father now look here he as long as he had not gone to the father he could not be everywhere present why just because of one reason he had become human. He had become man. So there are certain things. I'm, the, the whole point I'm saying is we, can, we are able to get from Sister White certain quotations 
that will speak to what I'm saying, and I will we will have to check the other quotations that she speaks uh, or on the other end, including on the issue of fullness, which we have really studied. We have had a, a study on the fullness. What does it mean? So I, we have read fullness to mean all the attributes of divinity, but we have come in our studies, um, uh, there are some brethren I've done those studies with, we have come to conclude, and we could be wrong, we could be right, that when the Bible is speaking of the fullness of God, it is not speaking of all the attributes of God. It is not. Such that because even that fullness, we will get quotations from pioneers and even Sister White, we can check, that we too partake of the fullness of God. Then, do we partake power to forgive sin or no? Do we partake uh, power to create or no? So um, this, this is an area which, um, either way, me, I hold any brother here to be a brother about the omnis, if, if whichever way you look at it, but we can look at the quotations. But I'm saying from the scriptures, uh, we will find very limited room on, on certain points which we will need to check what was Sister White speaking so that we can get the total sum because she uh, it's not possible she's speaking both ways. For example, when she says as God, he could not be tempted. Now, do you, my understanding immediately will be when he was in heaven, quickly, immediately. Now, the other, the other danger is some, when we say Christ had divinity and humanity, some people want to believe that divinity could not be tempted and then humanity only could be tempted. So there were two persons all the time. I think that's not the idea. That's not the idea. The divine son, divinity having combined with humanity, had capability of being tempted. That's the idea I see there. But now, when, when, when as God, meaning in heaven, and in fact, I, I'm just, I'm, in heaven, we can, we can get those quotations I'll have to go look for. Sister White says somewhere that in heaven, Christ could not be tempted. In heaven, he could not. So when we read, as God, he could not be tempted. When was he as God? In heaven. Now, here was he, how was he? While being the divine son of God, stripped of certain aspects, we have agreed, stripped of uh, uh, form, uh, um, um, and one point really, was he immortal? I think the biggest point here, first of all, we might need to address, was Christ immortal here? Is that one of the things he came at with? Um, I'm having a document here by um, Longrace. I don't know, one of our pioneers of the latter time. That is Longa. Longrace. Longa, Longa. 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 Yeah, I read things there which I'm able to tolerate. To Longa, Christ laid down his life just before going to the cross. But to the rest of our pioneers, including the son of James White, which I was, the son of Sister White, and even Sister White herself, where she speaks that as man, he was mortal. So it doesn't mean that he was as man mortal, and then at the same time here, as God immortal. That will be confusion, really. Because he, um, reading Hebrews, kindly, let's read Hebrews. Let's just read a verse in Hebrews. Uh, let's read a verse in Hebrews. Consider time. We have yeah. gone overboard. Yeah, just one, one text in Hebrews, and then I, I leave it there. But I will be requesting maybe to our preparation for this study. We can have this study uh, as a standalone. Yes. Um, Hebrews chapter 2. Uh, that, that, that's the last. I just read that text. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 9. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 9. Uh, it says, Hebrews chapter 2, verse 9, it says, But we see Jesus. But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than angels for the suffering of death. Now, that, that immediately says, he was, before he came here, I mean, I can't explain that, but just as soon as he became man, he was made mortal. Meaning, and it, it was not like mortal and then immortal, with immortality. No, he was just made mortal. And that is, that is the mystery of incarnation, that that which was immortal was made mortal. So now, can, and what is... Can I interject, Brother Angasa? Yeah, 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 quickly. While you are saying that uh, actually he didn't have powers, actually yeah. and saying that immediately he became man, uh, yeah. the omnis were not there, you are really making Christ altogether human without divinity because uh, yeah. actually we have to maintain also the quote that uh, they had two individualities in him. And uh, when we speak about... Uh, uh, the things that Christ could not do because he was cumbered with humanity. I believe that uh, we don't have to read uh, that cumbered with humanity means that uh, uh, now uh, uh, the divinity was not there. It was there, but what I understand by cumbered with humanity is the agreement that as a human, he could not do those things. So 
uh, he was cumbered by that agreement of being human. So he could not do that. And uh, the reason why I interjected that is because of this quote, the divine teacher will exercise his power in a larger measure now, meaning at that point when he had to live like a human being and show man what man could do and not God could do, he could only exercise a smaller measure of the power, but not a larger measure of his power, which actually it was cumbered by him taking humanity. Okay, Brother Sami, the, um, my reading of that, uh, about that quotation on cumbered with humanity, and I'm very aware about making Christ altogether human, uh, because I, I've read that text. Um, remember, I maintain he never lost his divine sonship. And when we want to make, you see, when Sister White writes that quotation about don't make Christ altogether human, he's speaking to those people who reject the divine sonship of Christ. That is the divine birth. That's saying that he was just a man here, recently here. That's, uh, uh, that's, that's my first thought, that to make Christ altogether human is to remove him from his divine birth. But certain aspects were stripped of him. Like the one, the one I really want to insist on is the issue of immortality. Before even we go to the omnis, did Christ come with immortality here? Did Christ come with immortality? That's my biggest question. Did oh, Christ oh, come with immortality here? I, I wondered uh, maybe that one... Uh... I really appreciate uh, your, your, your submissions and uh, uh, I really humble myself that uh, we can study more. You know, man is fully, fallible. Only God is infallible. And so i like us to really explore it. And I get your point and getting your point because I have ever thought about this, uh, uh, that uh, when you look at Signs of the Time, May 10, 1889, uh, Christ on probation for a period of time, Christ was on probation. And then we are told that when Adam was created, man was dependent upon the tree of life from immortality. And the Lord took this precaution, lest man eat of that tree and live forever and become uh, mortal uh, uh, sinners. Uh, what I wanted to show that man was... Um, was born, man was born on uh, on probation. This is, um, children should be taught that they are only probationers here. So human beings were born under probation, even Adam. Christ, when he took upon himself humanity, he was also born under probation because his humanity was created. It did not have angelic powers. And if he could have sinned, he could have died forever. He could have been lost forever. And so uh, 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 he was born under probation that uh, uh, if he sins, then he, he loses his uh, deity. And so to be born under probation, it has to do with some things to be, uh, to be understood in immortality. And uh, I'll be looking so much in that, and I know people will be looking so much in that, uh, to be born under probation and how it coincides with immortality and mortality. Thank you, Brother Sami. I want to thank God for that yes. because you realize on my end, I am really going to be very acceptable to studying the omnis and, and, and I I'm willing to learn and accept that the omnis, it is possible they were there. The but one the point mortality. We, yeah, the immortality, that one, I'm saying as Seventh-day Adventists, Yes. And as people are going to stick to what our pioneers thought, that one we cannot even bring it to the table because the they, they whole idea to be put under probation, you cannot be put under probation when you're immortal. Mm -hmm. Then when, what are you looking for? Where you For what? What are you looking for? In fact, there's a quote there. I'm just not able to find the quotes quickly. Sister White says, uh, Jesus brought immortality to light. That is by, second by, Timothy. Yeah. Even, even Sister White has a quotation on that where she said that Christ brought immortality to life after the suffering. Meaning then, um, if we, if you cannot, because what is probation for? For what? To attain what? This is for me the mystery of the gospel. This is the wonderful condensation that he who was mortal, sorry, he who was immortal came here to look for immortality. That left that immortality to the Father and came as a common man to look for it. I mean, that is for me the, the mystery of the gospel. That is the, that, that is the glories of incarnation. That he who was immortal 
because he was given immortality by God, laid it down before he came here to the Father's land. And I will be able to show you that pioneers just said what I'm saying, that he laid that immortality to the Father's land. And remember, um, E.J. Wagoner says immortality is the chief most attribute of God. Look at here, Brother Sammy. Uh, uh, sister, um, Christ is stripped of immortality, but remains divine. Look at that. And because omniscience to, 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 to Wagoner, and I will be able to show that from glad tidings, to Wagoner, the greatest attribute of, immortal, of, of divinity is immortality. But Christ was stripped of immortality, yet remained divine. That's that. Those are those are those are sublime things, brother. Um, but if we are, we, I, I thank God. If we are we are here together on this one, I am not worried about the omnis. We can study them easily, but at least this one we must settle because if we don't settle this one and we allow it to be taken this way or that way, for the omnis I have no problem because, um, um, indeed, brother Sammy, I agree with the with the with the with the with the idea that if I left my son, the greatest temptation is if I left my son with the phone here in the house and he loved the phone, it is a higher temptation than when I went with the phone away. And, 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 and I'm willing to learn about that. But we must really settle permanently the issue of immortality that Christ was not immortal here. Thank if you. we say that uh, Seventh-day Adventism is perished, but, thank but I thank God you have, spoken, you have spoken the things which I was holding. So we can study about omnis later, God's grace. I really love the discussion. I really love the discussion, but it's now made manifest by the appearing of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who hath abolished death and hath brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. So it's only when the gospel is accepted and is lived that um, actually uh, we, we can po possess immortality and uh, we will uh, look into that issue. And also this ties in with the uh, uh, DA209, that precious quote I send you, DA209, uh, 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 point three, look at this, that that spirit of life in Christ, the power of his resurrection, the spirit of life of Christ, the power of his resurrection sets men free. So when he resurrected, that power that actually he resurrected actually sets men free from the law of sin and death. The dominion of evil is broken and through faith, the soul is kept free from sin. He who opens his heart to the spirit of Christ become a partaker of that mighty power which shall bring forth his body from the grave. So the spirit of his resurrection, which is the immortality, also gives us actually immortality. And uh, I'll be glad to explore those matters in a, a broader way. Really, wrong evangelists have raised their hand for so long. They are the ones actually giving us the, the last submission, and then they pray and uh, welcome the Sabbath for us and we dismiss. Brethren from Rongo, you are the ones making the final submission. Please welcome. Oh, okay. Can you hear me, Brother Sami? Yes, much. Oh, I actually don't have a submission. Yes. But maybe uh, I actually understood you, uh, you, the line of the idea you gave very clearly. I just wanted to request Brother Patrick because his idea was a little bit different. If you can make it in a, uh, in a summary way, actually what is the main focus of his idea so that we could understand actually in his idea, what constituted the divinity of Christ actually. If it is possible, you can do that one in a, in a summary way, either by writing, we will appreciate that one. Maybe another brother still had something to say before. Yes, I I'll limit the brethren in Rongo in just a few minutes so that uh, we may welcome the Sabbath. Only one. Yes, please go ahead. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, brother Steve, go ahead. I I I don't know whether I will consume a lot of time. We've been hearing please, uh, the please, discussion. Please don't consume a lot of the time. You have only <laughs> two minutes. Two minutes okay. is what we are having. Then we we, we end. Okay, we'll uh, uh, go to me the book of uh, DA uh, 240, maybe to share my thought in DA 240, uh, where we see the story of Christ where in Luke 4, where Christ, uh, they wanted to throw him uh, headlock. And now in DA 240, uh, they, uh, 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 Sister White explains that it was the ministration. I don't know whether you can cast it so that I can read it from there because of time. 
according to my understanding, then I know we, when we'll continue with the discussion, I uh, will have to gather more, uh, more knowledge because as per now, uh, I'm a bit uh, uh, confused, but I hope by God's grace, I will be helped. Thank you. Uh, 240, can you get it? 240 paragraph one. Oh, no, you go, can go ahead and read it because I'm rushing through some things. Yes, I can go ahead and read it. It says, uh, when Jesus referred to the blessings given to the Gentiles, mm -hmm. yeah, the first national pride of his hearers was aroused, and his words were drawn in a tumult of voices. These people had prided themselves on keeping the law, but now that their prejudice were offended, they were ready to commit murder. The assembly broke up and laying hands upon Jesus. They thrust him from the synagogue and out of the city. All seemed eager for his destruction. They hurried him to the brow of precipice, intending to cast him down headlong. Shouts and melas uh, filled the air. Some were casting stones at him who, uh, when suddenly he, he disappeared from among them, the heavenly messengers who had been by his side in the synagogue were with him in the midst of the maiden's throne. They shut him in from his enemies and conducted him to a place, uh, uh, conducted him to a place of safety. So I can see that the, it was the ministration of the angels that really took Christ and protected him. And uh, I was able to come out of the people and go to a place of safety. Another quote that I will have us to share is that uh, our high calling, 48 paragraph two, our high calling, 48 paragraph two. Uh, meanwhile, I'll read, Meanwhile, I will read uh, the A66, paragraph four, six, six, 64, paragraph four, as my brother is uh, uh, looking for me, that one. I think six. you are reading the last quote, Brother Steve. Yeah, the, the, yeah. I'm reading the last quote. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, this one, I'll not, uh, it says, uh, if the disciples, uh, this is, 664 paragraph, 664 paragraph 4. Verily, verily, I say unto you, Christ continue. He that believeth on me, the works that I do shall he do also. The Savior was deeply anxious for his disciples to understand for what purpose his divinity was united to humanity. He came to the world to display the glory of God that man might be uplifted by its restoring power. God was manifested in him that he might be manifested in them. Uh, Jesus revealed no qualities and exercised no powers that men may not have through faith in him. So I listened to one of the, uh, your quotes, which actually uh, did not... Uh, that he used, he, was, he used a divine eye to see Nicodemus. I think I don't understand it because here I can see that he, he, God was manifested in him, that he might be manifested in them. Jesus revealed no qualities and exercised no powers that men may not have through faith in him. His perfect humanity in that which all his followers may possess if they will be in his subjection to God as he was. So he was subjected to a God that everything, according to my understanding that he was doing, he kneeled upon God because he was subjected to God. And even us, if we'll be subjected to God, we are being told that uh, his perfect humanity is that which all his powers may possess. If, if we if we do that. So maybe I'll not read that our eye calling 48 paragraph uh, two and four because of time, 
but I think you can uh, cast it and even talk about it maybe other time. May God bless, bless you guys. Thank you so much. As I give you time for one of you to pray, uh, it is from Palm 22.2 that we saw, we read that Jesus' divine eyes saw Nathaniel praying and answered his prayer. And uh, we have somehow agreed that either it was through the revelation of his father or the revelation from the angels trying to really reconcile with what Dickens was saying. But uh, we found out that the word discern is not the word that should be used there because discerning is to be uh, face to face with somebody and then you can be able to comprehend uh, uh, some uh, thing, what is called discerning spirit, to be able to see in what is something inside the person. And uh, Brother Angasa said that uh, uh, if you say that uh, Christ knew what was in man when he was human, then it was a revelation either by the angels, guardian angels, or uh, from the father when he spent a lot of time in prayers and in morning session with the father talking about the daily activities, how they will be. Otherwise, also, I saw that uh, Elder Dan has posted uh, good quotes on the chat, and I hope we read them. And uh, brethren, Alsa, I'd like to say this. Thank you so much for maintaining the spirit that do not have debate or controversies. We must have this upper room experience every now and then. And as we are willing to learn and unlearn, because there are so many things to learn, but so many, many to unlearn, and we must be willing to accept we are fallible, even in the way we submit things, we are fallible. And so we should seek not to misrepresent a brother while he's submitting and listen keenly what he's saying. And I have seen that uh, really we are trying our best not to misrepresent anyone. Otherwise, blessed Sabbath to everyone. And uh, may one brother from Rongo be able to pray uh, as we uh, continue in the Sabbath of the Lord. OK, let us pray. Lord of Lords, Lord Almighty, we humbly come before you this evening, thanking you for the gift of the Sabbath that you have presented unto us. Be with us, give us peace of mind to go through the Sabbath and help us to welcome thy messages and interpret them and let them be useful in our lives. Pardon us our sins, Almighty Father, and prepare us for your second coming. Above all, let your will be done upon us. Journey with us through this life. In Jesus Christ's holy name, I pray and believe. Amen. 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 May I say, may your names remain in the book of life. Amen. 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 Am